good to be here. I know this is the last session of the day, uh, but I try to take a transformation from what you have been hearing during the day from a lot of software, the AI, the different algorithms and everything else. And, and I'm actually thankful to Lata to actually set the context for me to at least move from a lot of software space into some of the physical space. And, and, and I'll continue that into the hardware infrastructure that is what which is powering a lot of AI that all of us are talking about, right? So that's what I'll do in the next 30 minutes and, and then try to introduce what cloud infrastructure is and, and then how AI is bringing a difference to it. Uh, a, a quick disclaimer just to keep my company and myself safe because I'm making some forward looking statements here and, and then with that I'll start. Okay. Uh, imagine some of the technology that has had the most powerful impact in the recent few decades that you have seen, right? Uh, with the click of a button, we are able to connect and, and, and talk to our friends, families, anywhere in the world. Uh, we are seeing uh, some of the genome uh, mapping that's being done in the medical in industry for the advancements that we are talking about. And, and, and similarly, we have also just learned about the autonomous cars or the driving that's coming in, uh, which is bringing in a, a very significant technological advancement, right? Uh, and then just like what Lata said, one of the biggest car company CEO has said that by 2025, they want to ensure their cars will be involved in zero fatalities for, for, for on the roads or, or, or for the people. Uh, people either within the car or outside the car, right? So we are talking about using technology to ensure that what used to be a million of deaths is down to zero. And that's the technology impact that we are talking about. Now all of these technology impact is, is done and then you very often see uh, many of these end instruments, right? Uh, they are computers, yes, whether it's a cell phone, uh, we said that we gave cell phone on a palm to everyone and, and then when now the future car that's coming in, we are saying that's computer on wheels that's coming in uh, for all of us. Now many of these are actually just the end equipments, right? They are doing a lot of sensing, they are lot of doing a lot of processing and they are maybe displaying and making actions on, on, on what to do or not to do. But there are also uh, a lot of infrastructure that happens behind, which is what enables these technology, right? And, and that's the infrastructure that I'm talking about, that it is a lot of computing, it's a lot of networking, storage, and, and then all of that combined together is what we call as the infrastructure, which started as an you know, on-premise infrastructure, moved into a cloud infrastructure, and is now moving into an AI era, which is just scaling that in, at a ma very massive phase. Now, now let's look at what is a cloud infrastructure, right? Uh, many, many equipments, many different use cases uh, uh, that you have, uh, and then you can see, right? Uh, you have mobiles through which you are doing a lot of connection, processing, and, and then networking. You have the compute power to be able to do a, a lot of processing. You have the storage elements to be able to store that locally, or over the cloud and then be able to use it later. All of these technologies are pretty good when it's all interconnected. The moment it's all interconnected, you can scale it up to do a lot of things that you can leverage it for the technology impact that we talked about. And that's the cloud infrastructure that we are seeing right now. What was on premises as a single computer moved into many computers and, and then the whole evolution of internet along with the high performance computing got us into an era where we have the internet plus cloud combination to enable this technology for us, right? Uh, now, what's happening in this cloud era? If you look at it, the cloud era, the way it's moving is uh, that there are so many applications in the digital world uh, that's moving in into the cloud and, and then pushing these clouds into what we call as a high speed performance or a computing uh, and then connected at GBPS speed and, and, and then having a, a, a multiple, multiple terabytes, petabytes of, of storage that we need to connect. That's the cloud era that we are talking about, right? But, but this cloud era 
is now taking a church because of the evolution of AI. Right? All of us have learned that for the three days, so, so I'll not introduce the AI, but I'll tell you is that since I come from a hardware or, or an infrastructure background, I'll tell you how it's impacting us and what we are doing about it. Right? Uh, to start with some statistics. Right. We already are hearing that AI can be some percentage close to what a human intelligence could be. Uh, it's debatable. Somebody says it's 20 percent. Somebody claims it's much higher. I'll not get into that debate, but it's there. But, but what has been told is that somewhere close to 2045, maybe AI will surpass or be same as human intelligence in, in, in many of the decisions that we do. Right. And, and then one of the examples that we saw which is what changed last November is the launch of what we heard chat GPT. It's just the one application, but I think that's the driver for many of these chains that we'll, we'll see in the years to come or the decades to come, right? It was launched in November and, and, and what we saw was that generally what it takes to, to reach 1 million users for many of the technologies, some of the past technologies took years, months, Maybe that's where we were at months, and then we saw the chat GPT came in, and it took just five days to reach a million users. And not just that, and as it continued, the hit to the website where the chat GPT tool is there moved up 100x times into 1800 million clicks on the website to be able to download that software and then be able to learn a lot about a lot of those things. What's going behind that? If you, if you know that there has been almost close to 10 plus billion dollar investment, which OpenAI did, and then followed by the Microsoft, which also added up 10 billion on top of it, to have that investment to build that chat GPT, which was three, and then the four that we saw coming out from there, right? And, and, and since then, there has been a lot of upgrades that are happening, but, but, the, but the whole training, that's been happening is, is a humongous volume, right? Almost, we have said is that the 175 billion parameters were used to train the GPT-4 model that we had, right? And, and, and if we kind of convert into something like that, like wiki pages, there was like almost 5.7 billion wiki pages was included to, 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 to put that as the data, use it for the learning, and then create the model that we all use for, for, for maybe for some fun, maybe for some exploration, and, and in many other applications that we are talking about, right? It's already estimated that by end of this decade, maybe AI will be contributing to almost 60% of the worldwide GDP through the applications, through the infrastructure, and through everything advancement that we are talking about. But what's the cost of this inferencing that we have to bear? And that's the cost that I see. And I'm going to tell that story to you all, right? Uh, before I reach to some of those data numbers, uh, you have seen the impact of some of these Gen AI wave that we are seeing. There is huge investment coming in at that fast pace to be able to take it from where it is to, to, to the future model and many more use cases. Uh, but you see the business impact already. One mistake done by one of the tool and you see the company has an impact of $100 billion market value. One company was at right place at the right time to bring the right infrastructure, which can be moved from the traditional gaming world into a much more uh, AI world, has gone on to go cross the existing big players in the hardware infrastructure and be the most respected or the biggest market cap value, right? So that's the wave that we are talking about, to which is driving this infrastructure chain, right? Some more statistics to give you, right? Uh, GPT-3, uh, I know you all may be using it, but, but imagine when it was being trained, what was the hardware infrastructure that was used? There were 10,000 plus GPUs that was the infrastructure where this learning and inferencing was happening. It ran for more than two weeks, and, and, and it took a humongous amount of power to do this training, right? And, and then just so that you can correlate to, to, to this power, this is almost what we say is that 20 plus homes in US can be powered for an year is what the power that we are talking about. 
Now this is just one application and, and, and one training that we have done. Imagine the number of applications that we are all talking about across the industries. If we start doing all of them together today, we'll burn this up. That's what will happen if we have to go to the data centers and start running it. So what do we do from here, right? So to do that, we started looking at saying, what's changing in the data models, right? How is it changing, right? And then you see there is different AI models that's coming in, the different trends are coming. In general, if I just pick up the chart GPT as an example, almost we are seeing a 10x growth in the data model every year as a new neural learning algorithm is being put together. And this is just the beginning. Again, I'm repeating that this is just the first application and, and then there could be many other applications which will start increasing it at much faster space, right? So if it's increasing at 10x the space, the data, that's the data that needs to go on a, on a hardware to be able to compute, to be able to transfer, store, and then do a meaning analysis so that all of you can run your all the softwares, the search engines, and, and, and many cool things that you have been bringing in. And, and, and how do we do that? And, and, and that's what we are looking at, that what was traditional, and then what you see here is, is a look of what a data center looks like, right? And these data centers are racks of, of, of racks, multiple racks, which will have the compute elements, some of the processors coming in from big processing companies. Uh, it will have the connections between these uh, uh, compute elements to the compute elements to create something what we call as a cluster. Then it will have a connection between cluster to cluster and then when it forms and then you will have a connection between data center to data center. So there is a lot of what we call as a compute or a processor and a lot of networking involved to run at that speed so that we can do things at the fast pace that we all want without waiting for it. Now traditionally what used to happen was that if you want to run some applications and you have this data center, you might use, let's say, 10 processing elements in the data center. And that's what I call that some of those 10 as a cluster for doing one of the previous compute elements from the data center that you are doing. This could be search engine, this could be storing your photos, this could be how your email clients is handled, and, and then many other applications that we talk about, right? But as we are moving forward into some of the complex places where it's no more just the text data, it has a lot of video and many other forms of data, uh, which is itself bigger in size, and then the complex number of parameters, and, and then a complex algorithm to solve it, this is increasing. And that's where we are seeing this class, cluster size is maybe becoming hundreds of them to be able to do that analysis. Some of them are reaching into thousands as a cluster. And what I just gave you an example, a GPT-3 fits here that it used 10,000 cluster, right? And what we anticipate, that some of the next training or inferencing that you will be doing, will be using the whole data center for training that particular application. The whole complete data center is being just dedicated to one application that we are talking about, right? And, and then if we do this maths, right? This data center, if it's being used above, and I'm not even talking about full data center, I'm just talking about maybe what I called as, as those, uh, the hundreds and thousands uh, of the computing as the, as the cluster, this would mean thousands of what we call as the compute chips that will be there. It could be the CPUs, it could be the GPUs, it could be the advanced FPGAs, DPUs, or it could be a very custom uh, silicon that's being made. But along with that, you will have a lot of networking elements. And these networking elements, which was more wired and other things, is moving into an optical space because we are reaching at a speed which cannot be done in a traditional wiring space. So there will be a lot of optical that will be there, connectivity. There will be switches to ensure that the data flows into the right place depending on where it's going. And, and, and then a lot of memory and, 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 and a memory controllers to be able to ensure that we support these kind of application. Now when this is the power, this is the example of some of the companies that have some of the biggest data centers and they are enabling some of these use cases to show saying what it means, right? And, and if you see most of the biggest hyperscalers, they are there. 
and, and then they are claiming and they are again validating that fact you need tens and thousands of the, the CPUs and GPUs and the different TPUs, the way their processing is, along with multiple other entities to be able to create an AI supercomputer and then use that for training for an autonomous vehicle perspective, the improved search engine, giving you a tool to figure out and erase a dog and, and then replace the background to do uh, uh, something. All of that would need these kind of an hardware infrastructure. Now, now that's the introduction which I wanted to ensure so that you understand what is the scale that we are talking about with the whole AI era that we are talking about. And if I expand this, when I go and do those small chips, right, so that's what I do uh, as a designer, as a day-to-day as a -day engineer, and, and when I go and do these chips, the usual parameters that I measure is that how many nanoseconds does it take for a data to transfer from one place to another. The second parameter that I measure is that how many milliwatts or a microwatts I will use if I'm doing a specific operation or an optimization that people are talking about. Another parameter that I use is that what would be the size of this chip that I can make which will finally decide what is the cost of this chip and hence there's a dollar value associated to it. With the scale that we are talking about, I do it on one chip but imagine this going into 10,000 for just one cluster or use case and if I multiply that by thousands more use case, we are moving from having a problem of that nanosecond moving into second, which means if you do a search engine and then you're sitting having your tea, coffee and then waiting for a response, it is moving into power which was maybe a, a nanowatts or a microwatts into what we call it as, as, as watts or, or, or something else. And, and, and then it is also moving what could have been a cent or a dollar into a million dollars. That's the scale that we are talking about. Now, how do we optimize that scale is where a lot of customization is coming in. While there is a traditional use case for a general purpose CPU, DPU, GPU that I talked about, but a lot of places, most of the cloud companies is looking at what their use case, what their workloads are, and accordingly customize this hardware infrastructure. And, and, and then ensure that I save that milliwatt of power, I save that millisecond of transaction time and I save that sense to be able to scale and make it a big business case for myself, right? So this is concerning, right? This is unsustainable. We are seeing 10x model growth. We are seeing that we will have large models which will need the entire global compute that we have and, and, and this compute will not be enough for the infrastructure that we are talking about. So what are we doing, right? This is where the transformation needed and this is where I, I wanted to bring in that the, the whole AI era or the AI generation or the applications need a scaled infrastructure, a transformed infrastructure to be able to ensure that we support all the dreams and, and, and the fancy tools that you want to run on all that, right? Now, now why we do that? Because every cloud is unique. Some of you might be from a, a e-commerce background, some of you could be from social media, there could be entire enterprise applications, there are search engines, many other. Each one has a very different use case. Someone will have more text versus, you know, the, the, the audio and video. Someone will have an editing capability versus just the response. Uh, someone will have a lot of data because there are so much consumers and users. There's all different use case. And that's where each cloud is a very different. The way it's implemented by a cloud provider one versus another is what you see is very different in terms of the hardware infrastructure, right? And, and then how it started, uh, maybe I'm going a little detail into some of the hardware parts, so I'll maybe do it faster. How it started, I think many of you would know what started as a traditional x86 architecture, which was the, with the, the platform to build the first CPUs. So you put that and you have a software layer and, and then you repeat that and then you thought uh, this combination of this hardware and software can help you get to the scale that we are talking about. It did for some time. But then as we saw recently with the cloud center expansion with many of the different use cases, this has become very heterogeneous in nature. And when I say heterogeneous, it is not just a traditional CPU which is x86. It could be a GPU, it could be a DPU, it could be a FPGA. There are multiple different processing elements based on different architectures that could be coming in, which is for a specific purpose. CPU is very good, 
for a, a specific computing. Whereas GPU was very good for multiple workloads that we see. And if you want to do parallel. And then we saw DPU and an FPGA coming in when you want to accelerate some processing, do it in time, and then and, 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 and be able to leverage some of the hardware capabilities. And, and then how this was done was that it has gone in the cloud world now that this is again nowhere that I pick it from the shelf and then be able to use it and build it. Everything is again custom that you build it for a specific use case and then go build your specific uh, cloud optimized silicon, right? I'll, I'll continue. Now, this is compute. Imagine this repeating not just for compute, but for network, memory, storage, optics, security, many of these things. So all of this is combining together to bring to a world where to enable these infrastructure, we have to make a lot of custom differentiated hardware silicon, which goes and fit in into this overall infrastructure and, and, and enable the power that we are talking about, right? Now, what is this cloud optimized silicon, right? What was traditional, if any one of you have used uh, or maybe assembled a computer, you would have gone and then picked up some of these elements. So you will go and find on the shelf saying, hey, I want this processor with this speed and, and, and multiple other use cases. But what's happening is, is that, that this is no more the same, right? Uh, and many of these, whether it's a cloud supplier or, or, or the big AI enabler, the autonomous vehicle people, they are coming and saying is that I have my own ML algorithm and I want to run it on the hardware, put it on the hardware and it's ensure that that uses that capability when the hardware is processing something. So I bring in my own ML algorithm. Similarly, somebody comes and says, hey, I have built in this cool security or a crypto engine and I want to integrate that inside this silicon and be able to utilize it for my security uh, uh, application that I am bringing in. So, so that's the change coming in that what was called as what you can pick it from the shelf is changing into something which is very unique, very different and, and, and this is not just the form factor. It goes into a lot of things about how the software and firmware is built on it, the, the different platform that it supports and then obviously the form factor of depending on which uh, it goes, whether it's going on a cell phone which is of a specific size, whether it goes on a big computer, on a rack or in car or, or, or somewhere else, right? And then this is what has been proven, validation by if you go in and then read through the, the media and, and in many other places, you will see most of the biggest hyperscalers and the cloud providers is saying that I am moving to these custom silicon to ensure I'm ready for that infrastructure that we need for the new generation cloud which is enabled to, to the AI. Now, what happens is that if you now, let's put together that this fancy high speed compute, the traditional CPUs used to run what we call as in GBPS, the new G GPUs that you will go and hear about or these custom TPUs, they have started reaching to the terabits per second speed, right? So when you reach to that, but when you connect, there is what we call as different network elements or ethernet elements, they have not been able to scale at that level. In which case, you cannot really utilize the full power of the GPU that you have. Maybe you are able to use a 30 to 50 percent of, of that. And, and then since you are not able to do it, it could cause a latency issues, it could cause a bandwidth issues, and, and then maybe run into the memory capacity, right? What will this mean is that while you build the biggest of the compute or, or best, get the best of it, if you are using only 30 to 50 percent of it, uh, and then maybe it costs many dollars, which I think the data I've heard is that it costs maybe 35 to 40 dollars per hour to be able to run these data centers and then provide this, uh, the computing power and the network to different applications, you will maybe be able to get only a 15 dollar efficiency because you're not able to transfer the data at that speed. Uh, once you do that, that means you need more computing elements. If you need more computing elements, that means you're increasing the power. If you're increasing the number of elements, you need more real estate, you have a so-called as a optimization problem that you are getting in. And, and, and that's where we need the second level of enhancement, not just in the computing, but also in the network side of things. And there are two parts of the network. 
there is what we call as an inner network and what is called as an outer network. Imagine the inner network is something which is between these computing elements, a GPU to GPU, a cluster to cluster, and that needs an improvement in, 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 in the way how the speed is done. But then the second one is to the external world when it is going from a data center to data center or a data center to one of your application that it's running. And then both network elements need a significantly push to be able to accommodate that level of computing power that we are doing. How do we do that? That's where you will see that optics is coming in and in replacing the regular wire so that immediately from a processor if the data is coming out, it is converted into an optical form and then transferred across and, and then be able to leverage a speed which is 10 to 100 times faster than what we saw there. So, so, so optics is what will enable us between computing and, and, and the networking that we talked about. And this is one of my company's uh, slides just to ensure that, that we are a hardware company. We have all these applications to provide that compute, provide that storage and networking elements to enable the scale that we need from a past cloud infrastructure into an AI infrastructure. Now all of this optimization cannot be done alone. Uh, this is where we need a lot of collaboration that we need to do. Uh, the collaboration started when the PC came in. Uh, it moved well as the internet came in, the mobile world came in, and then we moved to the cloud for a lot of these things. And today we are moving to AI where we can do a lot of learning and inferencing to be able to make decisions and, and, and make the world better, right? So, so key takeaways, just to summarize my talk from here is that AI is taking the cloud infrastructure by storm. We are seeing that the scale is, is many, many order bigger than what we have seen earlier. It will need a, a, a lot of unique customization elements to be created. And, and, and that's where you bring in the custom silicon to ensure that the infrastructure has that heterogeneous networking, computing, storage, and, 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 and security built in. And, and, and that's where we drive the future AI era. And, and, and that would enable all the workloads that we are talking about, the new technology enhancement that I started with, whether we continue to move in this mobile and internet world to the next level where how long it takes for us to be able to communicate with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the space uh, uh, mission that we have sent it to Mars or Moon, uh, what kind of more performance computing that we can do. Uh, similarly, how do we get to the level five of uh, autonomous vehicle where we can leave our hands, maybe sleep, and, and then ensure that the car will take you to the place where you want to and in a safe way and in many other uh, advanced speeds. So, so that's my introduction to, to what the infrastructure needs to be scaled and, and, and I'm open to questions that you have. the big data center companies will do the data center. 
but this is a classical discussion happening in most of our workspace today when even I go and do design there are a lot of things that I do on premises with more of my simulations and everything else but I'm seeing I'm reaching to a point where I'm going to reach not just thousands many ten thousands and other servers to be able to do that simulation and I just achieve what I want to do and that's where now if I do that it might not be needed every time so there is a peak that I saw in the 12 months maybe for a one month or a two month or three months and for the rest of the time maybe a 40 percent need of it and that's where a lot of people are taking a business case that what is an on-premises for your immediate need which is maybe your critical data or something you need fast, something is confidential that you want to keep it on your own because you are worried about security or a latency or a turnaround time versus what you want to scale and is available only on need basis, right? And that's the balance that most of the companies or the most of the people are doing to figure out what it is. These data centers or these cloud providers are playing the exact role of enabling saying I'll give you what you need on a day to day basis or a week to week basis or a month basis and you will pay only for what you use. So, so again it's a very big business case to you, for you to decide which is the tip off point where you move from this to there because you need not worry about the reliability of the data center uh, and an 24 by 7 upkeep of it, the thermal cooling and many other requirements that's not your what you call as an area of strength to worry, I would rather bring an optimization or a new algorithm rather than worrying about a real estate management, the thermal and many other things of it. So, so that's where the answer lies uh, more as a business rather than a technical problem. Just a follow up question that what is your view on the evolution of the capability of edge computing? Because that's, that's kind of a new area for us yeah. and yeah. we are today also in the AI world discussing about the size of your AI so that it can be done on a smaller edge device. Yeah. Now, traditionally whatever we've worked on, the edge device does not have the compute capability, it has the memory capability but does not have the compute capability. So what is your view on how the edge device, given that you work in the design space, yeah. how does how is that going to evolve and will that then have a indirect impact on my need to go to a data center? Yeah. How yeah. much can I you know, yeah. achieve on an edge device? True, true. And uh, that's where is is where we work, that's what my innovation come from, is that how much can you move to edge or retain an edge is driven by multiple things, right? Not just the form factor, but the size of this what kind of capacity can you build in and what kind of power that can you enable there because it might not be connected by a, a, a power but it could be a battery operated and that's where the decision happens, right? So, so you can put it only the computing worth that can be supported by battery and you don't need to change every two hours or every four hours a battery maintenance cycle rather than worrying about your computing algorithms and there, right? So, so what we do is that and, and then you will hear these terms like when we make it computing or many of other silicon applications, we have been moving from what we started as many hundred nanometers to now five nanometer, three nanometer, two nanometer. What that scales us is that we reduce the transistor size so that if I want to make the same functionality available in the next silicon, in the next form factor, it reduces by size somewhere around maybe half of it and also reduce the power that is consumed. In which case the same battery can maybe run it for twice the time to be able to enable that compute or that algorithm. So, so that's what we are bringing in. Edge will continue to remain because you need something on the fly like the previous one that you talked about. Uh, there are some decisions that needs to be done in the car right there and then you do it. But then some is about driving patterns that we talked about. Those are the ones that you transfer to the cloud and then you merge with many other data comes in and then send the software back and it's upgraded so that the car can take better decision about the traffic in this thing, about a particular weather or all of that, right? So edge will remain, continue to evolve significantly. I will contribute by reducing the form factor, by reducing the power, but, but both will coexist because you will, the amount of data, right? We, we, we heard, right? You just heard from autonomous vehicle, 
but we are seeing the same thing on our YouTube, the OTT, the emails and other things. It's just so huge that, that you can't do it, everything on edge. Only critical applications or maybe a little more will exist there. Okay, there are no other questions. Thank you very much and, and, and have a good day.